Yes, so hello and welcome everyone. My name is Christiana. I work for the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. And if you're not familiar with what we do, just a very short sentence about us. We work to enhance visibility and impact of development studies at large and connect researchers and academics across disciplines and countries on topics related to global development. And uh, I'm very happy to give the floor to Tommaso Ferrando today, who works at the Institute of Development Policy at the University of Antwerp in Belgium, which is one of our members and who took the initiative to organize the blog series and this event today, which will highlight critical perspectives on debt-based green finance instruments. So the floor over to Tommaso. Thanks, thanks a lot, Christiane. Good afternoon to everyone on, uh, on my behalf and thanks a lot for joining this uh, very interesting, I hope, uh, uh, conversation that we hope will uh, have all of you participating uh, towards the end with the question and answer. So as Christiane said, my name is Tommaso Ferrando and I work both for the Institute of Development Policy and the Faculty of Law at the University of uh, Antwerp. So the idea of the online meeting today is to get the conversation going around a series of blog posts that have been uh, recently published by, by ADI, the European Association of Development Research and Training Institutes. And I'm really thankful to, to Christiane for, for the work and for the amazing support that uh, she gave us in the last uh, weeks, uh, if not months. Um, the link to the blog posts uh, have been just uh, shared, but probably we can, uh, we can share it uh, again. Um, it's a series that I co-edited to co-supervise uh, with my uh, friend and, and colleague, uh, uh, Gidre Jakubaskaiti, who's also one of the authors of the, of the blog post that we will hear from um, today. Um, so I will uh, briefly set the scene for today's conversation and then immediately give the floor to the people who have uh, much more interesting things to say than just uh, the logistics. But to do that, I'll share my screen briefly so that uh, you can also follow me a little bit better. So as I, as I said, uh, this blog series involves uh, one introduction and uh, seven uh, chapters. And today we will have uh, five of the seven authors presenting uh, very briefly their uh, intervention. And then we'll uh, have the opportunity to hear from uh, three people whose trajectories are intersecting uh, the, the two main pillars and the two main arguments of the conversations today, which are depth and the green transition. So very briefly, how did the idea came about and uh, why did we decide to, to focus a whole uh, blog series on the relationship between uh, depth and uh, the green transition or how we define it in depth in the green transition. So I must say that this is a conversation that has been going on for more than one year. Uh, it had a moment last June at the Law and Society uh, Association gathering in Lisbon where we got together and shared our first uh, thoughts. Uh, and back there in, uh, in Lisbon, there were also colleagues from, uh, from Brazil in particular and other colleagues who unfortunately couldn't follow up with the, with the blog series, but that have been part of the, of the conversation. That to say that uh, although it may look like a very Eurocentric and, 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 and Northern conversation, it's a conversation that since the beginning really tried to bring in as much as possible the, the territories. And we're very glad that, that today, uh, not only there are scholars from uh, a back, with a background that is not uh, in, the, in the global north, but there are also people who are actively engaged in processes in uh, the so-called global south. So the idea, the, the main point, and, and really this is what we would like to, to discuss today and the reason why we, we gathered this meeting, is that there is a feeling uh, among us as, uh, as editors of the blog series, but also uh, among the, the authors of the blog post, that the use of debt and, and debt instruments has been increasingly normalized as a tool for the for the green transition, as a, as a tool to, to green the economic system and to support what in, in different places is different, the sustainable transition, the green deal, and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, that is not only present, but is significantly celebrated uh, in policy-oriented uh, literature. Uh, and we will hear about some of these examples, but we have an increasing amount of uh, policy oriented, but also academic literature that is talking about the green bonds, the blue bonds, the next generation EU, all that schemes in a very positive way. 
So in, in the framework of this uh, sea of very positive takes on, uh, on debt and debt instruments for the green transition, we thought that not enough uh, attention was paid to both the historical, the present and the future role of, uh, of debt. So we, together with the authors, we inquired uh, what has not been said or what is uh, often marginalized in terms of speaking about that through the lenses of, of history and understanding how the use of debt today, and in particular that obligation to repay and the obligation to give back both the principal and, and the interest has been constructing and building racial capitalism throughout the centuries, but is also defining a specific pathway for the future of, uh, of our society. So the three main repercussions uh, that we identified in our introduction that uh, I co-authored with, uh, with Ghidra, uh, and that there are somehow uh, sprouting here and there in the different blogs uh, is really this importance of connecting uh, the analysis of the present and the analysis of the use of debt with the historical patterns of what piling up debt and indebting people and society has been, uh, has been meaning. Um, but also we realize that uh, the use of debt and the use of uh, indebtedness um, is reproducing structure of uh, financial um, economic organization that actually led to the ecological destruction and the breakdown of the social cohesion uh, that somehow are presented as the uh, issues that want to be, to be addressed. So we question how the same instruments that brought us here can actually take economy and society and ecology uh, away from, uh, from that. And so we thought that it was extremely important to both understand the legal and the financial construction of that for the green transition um, and, and look deeply at the material and ideological implication that lie behind that and the, and the use of that that are often not discussed. And I think that for those of you who witnessed or participated to the so-called Macron meeting a few weeks ago, um, a lot of what I've been saying probably resonates as, uh, unfortunately, the new status quo of the normalization of debt. So as I said, uh, I'll give the floor now to the authors, at least five of the seven authors of, uh, of our blog post. Um, and, I, and I really hope that if you didn't uh, read them yet, you will have the time to, to go through the, the blogs afterwards, um, so to really get the, the, the depth of, the, of their reflection. And after a short presentation from, from each of them, we will then pass the, to the commentators that uh, are coming from both an academic and non-academic background and uh, have been so so uh, nice and, and, and so uh, kind to join us today for the conversation and really kicking off a conversation and, and a dialogue that uh, we hope will last even longer than this hour and a half that we have uh, planned. So the first blog um, in terms of chronological order, I would say, is that of Hector Herrera, who is a PhD student uh, at the Institute of Development Policy. Uh, you can see the slide already on uh, uh, your screen. And uh, Hector, the floor is yours. Uh, you have uh, a little bit of time, but not too much, to present the main idea behind your blog, and in particular, how are climate and debt connected, and why did you want to focus on this interaction? And uh, thank you, everyone, that who is connected today to, to this uh, space. Um, well, first of all, uh, green bonds, just a little clarification. Green bonds are bonds, and bonds are a debt instrument. And as a debt instrument with bonds, instead of going to a bank and borrow the money from, from the bank, you instead you go to the financial market and you borrow the money from the financial market, uh, and of course, you will need to pay back uh, that money with the corresponding interest rate or uh, earnings. And that said, bonds or green bonds are labeled green because they are environment and climate related. And I'll give a tiny example, just, just to clarification of uh, people. Uh, is uh, the uh, municipal green bond of uh, the government of Mexico City, which uh, issued uh, this in, in 2016. Uh, for 1 billion Mexican pesos, which is around 56 uh, million US dollars. And this was uh, the, the proceeds were used on, on water infrastructure, uh, uh, energy efficiency, and sustainable transportation. That's one example. That said, then uh, what, what is the central argument? There is two ongoing processes uh, in, uh, currently in Latin America and the, and the Caribbean. One is the, is the implementation of the Escazú Agreement on, on environmental participation. 
And the second one is the expansion of the green bond market in, in Latin America. So my argument is that the SCASU agreement serves as a, as a legal framework that needs to be applied and, and, and it's applied to the expansion of the green bond market and uh, on its uh, four pillars of, of this agreement. The first pillar is uh, access to environmental information. So here, for example, this is problematized by the fact that uh, green bonds, uh, green bonds issuance uh, may be covered by financial and non-financial corporate secrets, for example. Uh, the second pillar is the is the environmental participation or uh, participation in environmental decision making. And then like the issuance of the, of the green bonds where, uh, generates uh, obligations and expectations that may uh, narrow down uh, the, the, the space for, for environmental uh, participation. Uh, thirdly is the, is the, is the uh, protection of uh, environmental defenders and uh, the protection of environmental defenders must be a condition before, prior to, to the issuance of green bonds and of course of the implementation of the related uh, projects. Uh, and finally, uh, access to justice on environmental matters. And here, this is problematized. Uh, for example, uh, just one example of, of many questions that arises is like, uh, 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 if what is the liability of, uh, of uh, 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 what is the liability uh, of green bonds uh, in the case of like, uh, for example, uh, greenwashing misleads uh, investors of communities and how uh, judges or tribunals may, uh, may analyze or not uh, this uh, possible uh, situation. So, well, all in all, uh, 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 in finance instruments are the projects uh, they finance and, and this, this is a, uh, the SCASU agreement is a legal, a legal framework that needs to be applied. That's, that's the relationship. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Hector. And, and already you can see like one of the issues in terms of fragmentation and separation by, between different uh, regimes and, uh, and this very concrete proposal of, of making sure that there is convergence and that the processes don't follow parallel lines. So thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Hector. Um, the second blog post that was um, shared and that will be presented today briefly is uh, the blog post by Frederick Ulbrechts from the Institute of uh, Development Policy at the University of uh, Antwerp, where Frederick is currently the research coordinator. And as you can see from the title, um, the idea was to look at uh, microfinance through the lenses of, uh, of green and adaptiveness. So Frederick, if you can tell us more about, uh, or maybe the answer to your question, what does green mean in, in microfinance and how it is related to, to depth and adaptiveness? Hi, thank you, Tommaso, and uh, hi to everyone. Um, yes, indeed, it's uh, mostly that question that I want to uh, put forward and yeah see whether there is a, a response to that. Uh, what does green mean in green microfinance? And then maybe it's first important then to say something about what is green microfinance. So you may know about microfinance or financial inclusion uh, as the idea of providing uh, financial services such as small loans um, or insurance to people that were previously uh, not considered bankable or not included in the formal uh, financial sector. And so it tended to focus mostly on a combination of social and economic objectives. But recently, there has also been, been a trend of including environmental considerations, uh, for example, focusing loans on renewable energy or um, so-called climate smart agriculture. Um, and very often, it's based on, on, on the idea that taking into account such environmental considerations can really lead to a triple win of environmental, social, and economic uh, benefits. But there are very few analyses that actually look at how this takes place um, on the ground. And so that's what, what I think is really uh, important to look at and to see uh, when these translate into practice, to see what this relationship is between climate governance uh, and, and microfinance, especially looking into how the environmental objectives are being defined when you work with a specific instrument that is based on financial considerations, uh, how strongly do these considerations uh, limit, narrow the, the, the scope of what the objectives can be, how strongly do you focus then uh, on the most creditworthy or bankable um, uh, activities, and who decides 
on what is considered uh, green. So that's an important thing to, to see that there can be quite some power in green microfinance projects to provide discursive material support to some activities over other, um, but that it's not a clear uh, process as to how these environmental objectives are being um, uh, defined uh, and that they are not necessarily coming from a, a, a broader perspective of what is necessary or desirable for a transition or, or even better transformation of the existing system, but that they tend to be uh, very strongly uh, within that that system. And that's why it's interesting to have this discussion and to look at it from the debt side as well, to understand that this relationship takes place in a bigger, more complex uh, system. It sounds nice to say that you're providing financial services to improve resilience, uh, but what are the causes uh, of the vulnerability, uh, vulnerability that you try to... Uh, um, uh, tackle. Um, so that's that's a really important question that is not being looked at uh, sufficiently. And there's also the individual focus often through these microfinance projects that can be a problem when they try to tackle issues that may require a more uh, collective uh, response or more relations to, for let's say, uh, social movements, for example, or the definition of um, how to tackle these, these problems. So for the moment, I'll, I'll leave it at this short intervention. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Frederick, also for being very concise and, and for bringing to the floor some very important points that definitely animated us when we decided to, to put together this, uh, this blog series, which is the importance also of lo looking at the micro and not only at the macro. So we started with the green bonds as instruments that are usually adopted by, by countries or, or cities. And now we really wanted to go all the way to the, to the ground and the way in which individuals uh, may be dealing with, uh, with that and, and brought into a system of inductedness and what the consequences are and how the green narrative and, and some of the, of the buzzwords that you've been mentioning are playing a role in justifying and creating legitimacy. And I think that the issue of legitimacy is something that really cuts across the different uh, blog posts and, uh, and our own reflection and drive. And I'm sure that we will be uh, expanding later on, thanks also to our uh, commentators. So the third um, intervention is by the co-editor of the entire blog series that also found the time to, to write a, a blog in itself, something that I didn't do because I'm definitely way less productive and, and, and way uh, less, uh, less active than, uh, than Gida, but Gida Jakubaskaiti, who is um, at the moment a senior lecturer at the University of Glasgow Faculty of Law. Um, who will uh, well address the issue of uh, of benefits? So, as the title says, who benefits from mobilizing private sector investments for uh, climate transition? So, the question for you is uh, is the same, uh, Gidra. Why this specific perspective and how that uh, and uh, and greenness or greening are connected in your intervention? Thank you so much, Tommaso. So in my post, I'm actually looking at something that has been around as a topic for quite a long time, at least in the context of development finance, uh, notably the role of private investment in uh, uh, in creating sufficient finance for, um, for achieving certain public objectives, in this particular case, the objective of uh, combating combating climate change. So I'm looking at this from the perspective of, uh, squarely from the perspective of climate finance and in climate finance, I'm interested in this use of uh, public funds to catalyze private investment which, um, as the slide describes here, uh, I would call in Patrick Bigger, who is another author writing on this topic also in the blog series, uh, calls the uh, gap discourse or, or, or I think Patrick calls it uh, gap talk right so this idea that we don't have enough public money the urgency and the um, and the need for money is so huge that we have a gap and the only way to fill the gap is by mobilizing or catalyzing private investment uh, so the, 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 the problem with this discourse is that it is very natural, it is presented as something that is so self-evident that does not necessarily require much further discussion. And uh, most importantly, it leads to this implied conclusion that we don't maybe necessarily have to give so much money to the country directly, we need to give money to, for the countries maybe to create an enabling environment, which then would attract private investment to build wind turbines, build hydropower, build solar power and create other green measures. So basically in my post, I'm trying to challenge this, uh, this gap uh, talk as Patrick called it uh, by uh, comparing this private investment um, logic with uh, more traditional discussions about debt. 
and uh, juxtaposing them. And uh, what I'm doing here then in this post is I'm, I'm outlining some of the things that uh, mirror each other in this private debt context and in the more traditional public debt context. Uh, so what I argue is that in fact, uh, debt and investment are intrinsically inter interconnected to the point where they are just two sides of the same coin. So what we call an investment from the perspective of the global north, from the perspective of the communities living it is actually, or, or the country receiving the investment, it's debt right because debt is effectively a future commitment and so uh, any investment creates future commitments and some of the parallels that are listed here in the slide with um, public debt with the more kind of traditional dirty debt uh, that has become dirty in the public discourse over the last uh, couple of decades is that private debt still comes with conditionalities, right? So there's no investment that comes with no strings attached. So, so every country accepting private investment will have to accept certain conditions that come with it. Uh, every country that accepts an investment will have to commit to servicing the profit the imperative of that investment. So any repayment of that uh, investment will be on the shoulders on the consumers. And that repayment will be larger than if, let's say, the project was funded from the national budget. And finally, there is always conditions of dependence, right? Because every single investment um, requires... Um, uh, certain resources, but also mostly because of the, of the, the, the conditions also set, say, in the Paris Agreement, uh, countries have to take these uh, these uh, investments because they need technologies, right? And so, so there is a certain power imbalance that has not been resolved uh, in private investment as well as in the traditional public debt scenario. So basically, uh, we do not necessarily see the debt in the country's balance sheet, but it's there, it is less visible, and we have a lot less information about it, and that is a serious problem for climate governance. I would argue. So uh, I will leave it there. I will just mention a few of the issues that are, uh, uh, before leaving it there, I'll just mention a few of the issues. So uh, I describe them in more detail in, in, the, in the blog post, but for instance, there is this issue of intergenerational injustice with uh, these public, private investment schemes, because what they all rely on is on the idea that consumer will pay later. Uh, so it's basically this idea that we don't have to pay now, but our kids will end up paying for these investments for years to come. So climate is already an intergenerational issue, intergenerational issue, and, and I, I would argue that private sector investment projects make it even more of an intergenerational issue. Uh, it's an issue of common but differentiated responsibilities principle where effectively the consumers pay rather than the countries that are polluting the most pay for these projects and for these services. And then finally, there is, as I mentioned before, this issue of ongoing parent imbalance in the form of neocolonialism, where especially technology is required for these new green measures to be implemented, continue to stay with the companies in the public north, in the global north, and never really are being transferred or passed to the countries that need them the most to achieve their climate objectives. Uh, so I will leave it at that, but my main point of the blog post is that this idea that we absolutely need private investment to um, achieve uh, climate objectives um, is against the basic principles of climate justice. And it is not true that there are no alternatives to this approach. Thanks, thanks a lot, Gigi, for, for the presentation and for, for the blog post and, and also for bringing to the conversation both the issue of how certain kind of uh, financial instruments and financial tools are, are framed and what kind of legitimacy they, they build by also reproducing and repeating arguments that sometimes, or if not often, if not always, are taken for granted and, uh, and not challenged, and for bringing in issues of, of climate justice, international intergenerational equity, common but differentiated uh, principles, and neocolonialism that definitely represent a broader uh, set of, of principles and ideas and, uh, and notion that can be used in order to challenge the way in which the, the financial sector and, and financial dynamics are, are currently looking at the at the green uh, green transition and i'm sure that uh, your blog post and your intervention will uh, will raise uh, reactions by our commentators and uh, and hopefully also by the other writers and the participants to this um, online session so moving on uh, as we we started with the with the green municipal bonds and uh, and now or the, the green bonds and and now we we move to another area that has been particularly uh, on the hot uh, list of, uh, of financial uh, actors, but also of uh, certain governments and definitely has been increasingly discussed uh, in international panels around uh, climate change mitigation adaptation, which is the, the area of, of blue bonds. 
uh, and so the, the use of, of, of debt uh, and uh, debt-related financial instruments connected with uh, marine resources and, uh, and oceans. So the researchers behind this blog post is Arin Shonyat Klilic, who is a PhD researcher at the Faculty of Law at the University of, uh, of Antwerp. So thanks a lot, Arin, for, for being with us today. Uh, and the question for you is, uh, is the same. So why the specific take and, and how uh, debt and, and greening or debt and the sustainable transitions are connected uh, when uh, when you look at, at blue bonds and why does it matter to, to have this critical uh, approach to, to blue bonds? Thank you very much, Tommaso. So um, if I start with from a bigger picture, oh, I take blue bonds as the last frontiers in actually transforming the world's oceans into a development space. So basically this, of course, the whole turning oceans into development space is based on the belief that actually an environmental question, marine conservation is a question of inefficiency. So with this, of course, with, with this grant, the solutions come from technology, governance and finance. In other words, actually the whole blue bond agenda is based on ecological modernization, ecologically modernizing the blue economies. Um, actually, blue bonds, in my opinion, transmits the material and ideological processes of ecological modernization to island nations that have minimal contribution to climate change so far. And this type of modernization, of course, brings about the new conservation paradigm, which is conservation for further intensification of extraction of natural resources. And the moment we start quantifying nature as a servant of, of economic efficiency or simply growth, actually, as we define it in terms of natural capital or ecosystem services, then we start quantifying the marine ecosystems in economic terms. And of course, the moment we quantify marine ecosystems in economic terms, the main problem becomes the financing. Who will finance the conservation, as actually Gedra touched upon. Um, then, of course, if I refer to Andres standing here, then Andres work, latest work in 2022, actually then the conservation, the marine conservation is reconceptualized into a financial matter, a financial question. And of course, finance doesn't prioritize the spaces that need the financial resources the most, but the other places that can generate a financial return, right? So we don't financial investors, of course, don't prioritize the places where climate change adaptation actually is most needed, like island nations, but the, the places, the spaces and activities, economic activities that can generate a financial return. So the whole blue project in this context, if we read the blue bonds in this context, it then these financial tools, these financial innovations becomes the becomes ecomodern can becomes the transmission of ecomodernization to certain geographies. And actually the problem becomes how can investors receive safe deals, of course. And here basically my approach is that debt becomes the key component of such a financing model and such transmission, actually. Because in this way, through debt, private contracts shift the responsibility of climate action to the borrowers. And in the case of blue bonds, I try to problematize it in the case of two island nations that are Seychelles and Belize. Very briefly, of course. But one example of that actually changing the responsibility, shifting the responsibility, is to tie the conservation targets to financial punishments, right? So as I tried to show in the blog post, liability provisions actually play a key role. Liability provisions connected to that play a key role in shifting this responsibility to borrowers. Um, so basically, while investors actually incorporate safe ECG deals among social governance deals into their portfolios, island nations are left with the burden to meet both the legal agreements in this context, but also have meaningful adaptation outcomes with the limited financial resources they have. Um, of course, this creates a problem, as Jed mentioned again, this creates a problem in terms of combat differentiated responsibilities because island nations have minimal contributions to climate change. And actually, if you look at the current global stock take, the stock take they are the net sinks of our carbon dioxide emissions for actually absorbing, they are the net sinks for absorbing the carbon dioxide that the polluting countries 
developed countries are polluting. Um, especially carbon but differential responsibilities, this point comes important because actually true blue bond contracts, through the private contracts, when we look, island nations don't receive the money only for climate adaptation efforts, but also they are obliged to contribute to mitigation efforts as well. And of course, here the here comes the question of priorities, right? Because if we look at the national determined contributions of island nations, both specifically in Seychelles and, Seychelles and Belize, we see that adaptation efforts are prioritized. And again, in, in our international environmental laws, such as UNFCCC, Paris Agreement, and Convention on Biological Diversity as well, island nations and their adaptation efforts are explicitly recognized and prioritized. So in this context, this depth in, in these private contracts create a tension between our norms, our principles in international environmental law and these financing arrangements. And of course, as a last note, I this is I take this whole picture as actually as an example of pragmatic alliance, right? Because actually, in the absence of financial assistance, in the absence of commitments, or in the absence of commitments by developed countries or private funds as well, then, and in the absence of grants, actually grant-based instruments as stipulated in international environmental law instruments, then of course, island nations make pragmatic alliances or pragmatic choices with this type of debt instruments. So they basically find pragmatic solutions in the credit markets. If you think one of the as conclusions I got from my fieldwork is that they are fully aware of the consequences, they are fully aware of the injustice aspect of this, this, this type of debt instruments, but they don't have another choice. Island nations don't have other options than going into credit market and searching for financial resources for their adaptation efforts. So this I can conclude here and we can continue with the further questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Arinj. Definitely a lot of very valuable points also raised by you, the dialogue with the with the previous post and uh, with some of the posts that uh, that will be presented later and that have not been uh, that will not be presented today. Definitely this idea that uh, the choice of the financial tool is uh, is not neutral, but has a significant material implication at the moment that then the projects are, are implemented, but also they come with uh, specific paradigms and notions that are put in place and, and materialized. And, and, and when you talk about transforming or redefining or rewriting the, the oceans as a financial asset or as an appealing financial asset for the financial sector, I think that we can definitely relate it to uh, many other sectors in, in which we see finance and in particular debt finance um, operating. Um, but also the issue which uh, which is very valuable when we talk about the green transition or climate transition that you raise uh, when you mentioned that not all uh, projects, not, not all issues are financed, but only those that actually fit into the financial uh, necessities of the of the actors that are providing credit and, and that significantly reinforces uh, what is a, a shortage of adaptation uh, fundings and adaptation money. But also this idea of, of, of the pragmatism on the one hand and also the lack of alternatives that link, uh, I would say, also with a sort of historical understanding of how countries got to the point where they are and definitely that and indebtedness and international debt have a lot to do with the way in which countries don't really have uh, any other alternative or very few alternatives when it comes to financing the, their transition. Um, and I think that that's a, a, a good uh, uh, connection uh, with the, the final blog post that will be presented today, which is the, the blog by David Rossati, who is an assistant professor of public international law in the transnational legal studies department of the Vrij Universiteit uh, of Amsterdam, the faculty of, uh, of law. Um, and David has been uh, working for, for several years on, on issues of, uh, of climate financing. And so in, in, uh, in particular, loss and, loss and damage. And so in the, in the blog post, um, looks at uh, the idea of managerialism and, and the idea of like institutionalizing um, institutionalizing we're saying like a loss and damage through parameter standards and uh, and, and specific uh, frameworks. So David, thanks a lot for, for being here with us today. And the question is always uh, the same. So what is the connection between that and, and climate that you want to highlight in your in your blog post? And why does it matter to have a, have a critical take on uh, what is uh, unfolding before your our eyes? 
Uh, thanks, Tommaso, for giving me the floor. So in giving this elevator pitch, I will uh, answer quickly to your question that uh, the relationship that is created is one of tending to, towards form, forms of injustice uh, in the field of loss and damage. Uh, but uh, my, um, my blog post uh, here uh, looks at that in a, in a direct way. Uh, in, in a way, I got curious not much in the way in which uh, that is somehow regulated yeah, under the uh, International Climate Change Treaties, but more or less how uh, that is actually indirectly governed by uh, overlooked means of uh, deciding on how uh, the most vulnerable countries should uh, deal with loss and damage uh, on climate change. Uh, so uh, but what is loss and damage, right? Uh, as a concept in international policy, international climate policy is a contested one, but generally uh, it has to do with uh, the idea that uh, there are, of course, uh, slow uh, onset, but also extreme uh, climatic events that are severely uh, impacting the most vulnerable countries and uh, that are impacting them now, uh, but they're also going to impact them uh, increasingly, right, with more, even more frequency uh, in the future. And uh, as an international lawyer, the first time I read about this buzzword, loss and damage, I, I thought about compensation, right? So if someone receives a damage, uh, you, you're supposed to receive usually compensation under tort law frameworks. But the weight it has developed under the international climate change treaties uh, has taken a different direction. Uh, despite that, generally, uh, the idea of loss and damage then would uh, entail a form of reparative justice, right? So compensation, not just for uh, the damage that's been created, but also uh, forms of financial support for the future, uh, so for future damage that uh, the most vulnerable nations uh, will be suffering. And uh, so uh, if this is the context of loss and damage, I'm looking at a, a specific uh, development uh, of governance that has been taking place uh, there. And uh, I term it uh, as a form of slow development under the treaties, because I have a bullet list here that I made of the milestones uh, through which this loss and damage framework has been uh, created under uh, the climate treaties. Uh, and I just tell you that it, it started at least since 1992, uh, when a small island developing states made a call for establishing a common pool uh, of funding and also of insurance to cover yeah, the future risk from climate change. Uh, so this low development, however, under the treaties, what has generated? Well, has generated uh, a, a body, a framework, uh, an organ called the Executive Committee under the Warsaw International Mechanism, and it has generated work streams, and it has generated uh, networks, and all sorts of strange outputs to an international lawyer. Uh, it has not generated regulation, yeah, law or norms. So where I'm going uh, is that uh, in the blog post, I try to conceive then uh, two different dynamics that have been playing under this law development. Uh, the first is that there is a, an approach to the problem that resembles managerialism. And managerialism, I'll try to make it as brief as possible here, but basically it tries to deal with an expert lens uh, and to a management of efficiency through uh, uncommon outputs that, that are different from legal ones. Uh, and, and this is a, a, a dynamic that is taking place and prevails over the, another dynamic that of course is also taking place under the loss and damage framework, which is the one that I can roughly term climate justice, right? So the ones that is mainly spearheaded by small island developing states and the vulnerable nation that is trying to, uh, to claim forms of compensations and forms from debt-free financial, uh, financial support. Uh, so, but what is managerialism then, which argue it, it's prevailing under the, uh, the loss and damage framework? What, it, what is it creating? Uh, in under under the international climate change treaties. So uh, well, my main claim is that uh, through these uncommon outputs, uh, it's creating a, a shift of the financial burden 
which should be sustained by developed countries and the big, biggest polluters or the historical big, big polluters uh, towards instead uh, vulnerable countries. And it does so through, uh, for instance, in the field of uh, risk management to uh, uh, spe specific forms of, uh, of uh, instrument of insurance. Uh, I won't go into the details of that. Uh, but uh, instead, I, I will go down to the main conclusive points then uh, of, of my blog post, which is that uh, basically uh, these forms of managerialism are being are, are also the consequences that are, uh, that are creating a discipline that avoids forms of discussing compensation uh, within loss and damage, and also it is uh, shifting the discourse uh, from uh, potential alternatives of that free and more progressive proposal uh, towards instead uh, an assumption again of responsibilities from, from the least developed countries and also uh, a, a increased payments, right? For, for instance, insurance services and inevitably then increased debt. So this is my pitch for now. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, David. And uh, for David's post and for everyone else's post, I, I really invite everyone to go and, and read them because, uh, of course, in, in few minutes, not everything that is contained in the blog post can be can be unpacked. But thanks a lot, David, for, for raising the issue of alternatives that are not followed the moment that a specific vision and a specific set of, of tools is, is implemented, but also for embedding uh, the notion of uh, of debt indebtedness and uh, the climate finance in the broader framework of uh, countries, negotiations and, and agreements, which definitely uh, is a very important aspect of the conversation. Uh, just to move forward, I just wanted to mention two other blog posts, like the, the final two blog posts that uh, are part of the of the series that unfortunately cannot be presented today. One by Patrick Piga uh, on the narrow alley of bridging funding gaps with blended finance that, uh, as already was mentioned by, by Grida, expands uh, a bit on uh, on this notion of uh, the gap and the, the financial gap and, and the lack of public resources that open up the opportunity for, for private investments and private funding. And then uh, and uh, Patrick Big, uh, just to be uh, complete, is research director at Climate and Community Project. And then the other blog post is that by Stephanie Gracidonas Nieto, who is a PhD researcher at the Institute of Development Policy of the University of Antwerp, um, who is looking in particular at the notion of green and greenness when it comes to, to green finance and uh, more specifically at green bonds, opening up a uh, um, very valuable consideration on the actors, and in particular the private actors that have created a network of transnational governance around green finance and green bonds in, in particular that have to be questioned uh, through the lenses that, uh, that have already been mentioned, including by, by Kidra. So not to take more of your of your time, like uh, from, from our side, we're really looking forward to, to hearing from our three very generous commentators that are accepted to be uh, with us today and then even more accepted to, to read all the blog posts and, and to engage in a dialogue with, uh, with our authors. So we have uh, Maria Carolina Olarte Olarte, who is Associate Professor at the Faculty of Law of the Universidad de los Andes uh, in Colombia, where she researches and writes and teaches on issues concerning feminist and decolonizing approaches to law, including with regards to, to climate change, property and, uh, and social movements. So thanks a lot, uh, Maria Carolina, for being with us. Then we have uh, Yolanda Fresnillo, who is a Policy and Advocacy Manager at uh, Eurodad, uh, where she adopts a, a specific focus on, on debt justice and the debt justice uh, area of uh, Eurodad. Um, over the last two decades, Yolanda has been closely involved in local, national and international social movements and has campaigned on development finance, debt, human rights, feminism, environment, peace, trade and responsible consumption, along with many other things and many other uh, uh, functions that she um, has uh, undertaken in, in different organizations and even as consultant. And then we have uh, Dr. Andres Standing, who is a specialist in ocean governance and works with multiple organizations on the right of small scale fishing communities, particularly in uh, Africa. And for several years, he's been researching and writing about the financialization of, of conservation, which includes critical analysis of debt swaps blue bonds and the broader discourse of uh, blue growth. So we asked our uh, speakers to engage with the, with the blog post and uh, to phrase their comments um, and maybe already to engage in, uh, in some questions that uh, we hope the, 
uh, authors will uh, will be able to, to to respond to in particular with regards to, to time because I see that we have 40 minutes uh, to go. So if it's okay, I will start with uh, Maria Carolina and uh, I would ask you to to react to what you heard and 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 what you what you read. Uh, and we're really thankful that you are with uh, with us today, especially because in Bogota it's very early in the morning. So even an extra effort on, on your side to be with us uh, today. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much uh, for the invitation to come on this uh, very interesting and exciting papers. Um, so what I will try to do, I didn't want to be the first one, but I, I will do my best, is um, what I will tr try to do is to put together a series of comments for, uh, I think, all the papers and to try to enumerate a series of questions and uh, research paths and windows that I feel are underlying and are in the subtext of all of the blocks. And, and I would like to, to, to talk about these paths that I, I found in it, and I got very excited by this, uh, as a way to have a second, a second round of this discussion, echoing what uh, uh, Guidre said in, in, or suggested in his paper about Tina or the, the 80s Tina, that recalls me, that is this idea of what, 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 what we should do with it, there is no alternative way of framing uh, climate and finance connections. So uh, with the aim of having a second round, uh, uh, trying to see that uh, giving up another alternative is giving up uh, uh, climate justice, as uh, Piedre suggested. Uh, I'm going to start saying the following. So uh, one of the questions, and I think uh, one of the topics that are very strong, strongly suggested in many of the papers, uh, it has to do with uh, an immunizing effects of how climate uh, instruments, climate debt instruments, somehow create a fragmenting legal matrix and managerial matrix, echoing uh, Arink, uh, that makes it very difficult to um, debate legally at the national, international level, at least apparently, uh, and to confront the underlying assumptions of uh, finance and debt for climate uh, and how it, it works uh, as a fragmenting different ways of managerial and legal frameworks that are presented as if they didn't collide too directly and how it uh, creates a space of political immunization that uh, make it much more difficult to try to resist them. Um, the second the second issue that I saw in here, it's a question for, for many of you, and is that I was a little bit at odds, at, at, at odds with the critiques, but also with the framing of many of the questions about debt instruments. And is that I couldn't, I couldn't uh, understand whether uh, the, the purpose was to improve public policy, existing public policy on climate and finance, or whether you were uh, resisting them and, and uh, setting a path to uh, research uh, destabilizing critique to these kind of instruments. This is a kind of uh, question to move forward during our discussions. Um, the other issue is uh, not an issue, the other Question I wanted to highlight is this number of proposals of research paths that I mentioned before. So I just want to try to go through them, and then we can discuss them early, uh, later. Uh, and this is very especially important for the people here with us that are not part of the blog series, uh, in the sense that I think this is a uh, very exciting and important and urgent questions that the papers somehow are either opening or um, setting the path to continue researching them. One has to do with, uh, and this is also a question for all of you, it's uh, how the papers um, can connect and relate to a question on chip nature. Uh, by this, I mean how 
The question of making, as Patrick, I think Patrick mentioned, excessive profiting, the other side of the coin of uh, excessive profiting, it's how this climate finance contributes to producing nature as, as a cheap asset. Um, the other issue that I think that uh, is very powerful in, in the way we can read the, the papers together, it's how they create path, uh, and they put questions forward in relation to how to start a proper political and radical research on uh, the wider matrix of profiting. How can we start doing research, specific research, on looking at how the profiting is, is produced, the profit, how the profit is kind of a meta-constitutional uh, or, or a meta-regulator um, of uh, climate finance. Uh, this has to do also with uh, a collective research on how contractualization of uh, finance relations contractualization of, of what happens on the ground and uh, the, the on questions and assume ideas of infrastructure that comes with private and public alliances on the ground. And by this, it means is how to research this, how, we, how all of your papers go, or for me are asking to go into order into these legal forms of contractualizing issues. Um, also, I wanted to, to highlight this is, I, I, I would think about this when reading Frederick, uh, Frederick's paper, and it's how, I don't know how to say this in English, it is how these, all these a scenario of finance and climate and, and how in debiting the transition, it's, it's another version of the climate drop by drop business. I don't know how to say this. Maybe, maybe Hector can help me. That is the el gota gota uh, indebtedness, uh, and it has to do in Latin America and other countries how people get in debt by very violent uh, uh, people uh, sending money under very violent and very uh, structurally impossibly to escape conditions, and this is the drop by drop. Um, ways to survive through debt. So what I would think this is a kind of climate, or we are tracing here the drop by drop climate finance. Um, and uh, uh, finally, in this way that I think is so powerful, the whole, the whole uh, bunch of papers, uh, there is another underlying questions, maybe we have time we can discuss it, and it has to do with uh, <clears throat> the impossibility uh, or the possibilities uh, for uh, public trust litigation in climate strategic litigation when we are talking about public lands and public areas. Uh, so this is this is a topic that is not directly approached by any of you, but I think there is indirectly connected to sovereign debt to uh, the burdens put upon vulnerable states and uh, social organizations. And finally, and it has to do a lot with, uh, with what Patrick and Hector um, suggest in their papers, it's a, it's a concern with um, social movements and with people who has to acquire debt or get incorporated into wider public debt instruments in terms of how finance and for climate and debt for climate deter or, or obscures or turns into an obstacle for collective and communitarian organization. How the whole matrix uh, is a way for people not only to having to get into debt when we are talking about uh, microcredit, but also how they have to um, quit uh, collective organizations for the defense of their territories in order to either pay debts in the microfinance scheme or in order to satisfy their requirements on the ground 
of the different debt instruments. So I think this is a very latent and important question as we can see that there is happening in many, in many different parts of, um, of the world, especially the, the so-called uh, global south. So I will leave it like that. I there have many questions for each of you in particular, but the, we can discuss that when we open to discussion. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Carolina, for your uh, very valuable and, and, and transversal reading, which I really appreciate because it's definitely not an, an easy task that of bringing together like such a variety of, uh, of blog posts, but your, the points that you raise are, are extremely important and I hope that we're going to have enough time for, for reactions. But I also like the way in which you started, which is like a first step of a conversation and maybe the conversation doesn't have to finish today. The conversation can, can continue and finish in, a, in, another, in another moment. Um, I will now give the floor to, to Yolanda from, from Eurodat, uh, thanking you also, Yolanda, for, for your presence and participation uh, uh, today, and asking you, uh, again, if, if you can react to the blog post and uh, even uh, ask some direct questions to some of the papers that you found particularly uh, more like, closer to, to the work that you're doing, but definitely Eurodat and your particular experience are the convergence of, uh, of that and uh, uh, and the role of historical and present that in defining development is uh, is very valuable and and I'm really uh, uh, glad that you could find the time to to join us today. So Yolanda, the floor is is uh, yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for inviting me and thanks for the blogs because it uh, it really made a very good uh, breathing. I I, I um, I've been in a very busy moment and I read them all in in a row and I think they make a very uh, like good collection and 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 somehow uh, the, the flow uh, of the different uh, issues uh, made sense uh, to me. Um, I have uh, not so random, but uh, but several ideas that I wanted to share, uh, and and more than questions, they are remarks or kind of proposals on on way forward on some of the issues, and 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 the first thing that I wrote down when I was reading is the issue uh, that Giedre uh, also uh, highlighted uh, of the, and, and another, uh, some, some other of the authors also highlighted the issue of the uh, common but differentiated responsibilities and, and how this issue is central uh, to all of the discussions. Uh, because in the end, we're talking about debt instruments to, uh, to tackle uh, the green transition, the climate uh, emergency, uh, and in any debt instrument, it is the borrower who ends up pay paying. So if we're using uh, um, debt instruments in a in in a sector in a in in a in a process that uh, should be guided by the CBDR uh, principle, we're using the wrong instrument because then. It's uh, the ones who didn't have, who doesn't have, who don't have the responsibilities, the ones that are ultimately uh, paying. And I think here the intergenerational uh, issue is a very interesting issue that uh, several of the, of of the, or at least a couple of the of the articles put on the table. And I think th that is something that is recurrent in in many of the articles, and it's a, I think it's a central uh, issue when we think on. Uh, as uh, Carolina put it, it whether we are uh, resisting or proposing. And if we're making proposals in terms of, of policy, uh, if we want to put this principle in the, in the forefront of our proposals, uh, then the, the way forward is uh, one way. And if we don't, uh, then we can just do small reforms in, in what's going on and, and that's it. The second issue is I, I found the the um, Patrick's uh, sorry that Patrick is not here but Patrick's article on on the on on the financing gap uh, which is beyond the financing gap but the whole argument around the financing gap very interesting uh, and I I think it, one of the problems. Uh, with this approach of the green transition and the climate emergency uh, from the financing gap uh, perspective is that then the solutions, or it might seem that the solutions can be just met by throwing more money into the problem. And that we probably all know that that is fundamentally uh, untrue. 
uh, and that uh, first, if we do not address the origins of this financing gap, so uh, from unequal uh, relations uh, to uh, uh, speculative uh, interest rates uh, to, to 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 the way some of these uh, <coughs> dependency relations uh, are um, uh, perpetuated, then we are trying to solve the financing gap with widening the financing gap because any uh, lending instrument from the market will have interest rates. So if, if from a start uh, you try to solve uh, an issue of uh, lack of, of financial resources by throwing it in it an instrument that will require uh, more financing resources uh, to um, uh, to pay back the debts. Uh, there's a there's a blind spot there. Uh, obviously, the answer to this blind spot with the issue of uh, growth, but uh, then we have the redistribution issue and who is uh, really getting the the, um, the 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 profits, the benefits of this uh, of of the of the economic growth that these investments might might produce. Um, and then the third big element, and then I'll go into the, into uh, some more concrete things, is uh, something that is also present in several of the articles, which is the role of the private sector, uh, and 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 this idea that what is being imposed uh, and what is uh, the, the 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 main way forward uh, presented by international financial institutions, multilateral development banks, think tanks, and uh, etc is this de-risking uh, trend uh, that uh, uh, kind of institutionalizes what the civil society has been criticizing for decades, this uh, public losses versus private profits uh, principle. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and also, uh, and I think something that I found a little bit missing in the, in the articles is how we can learn more lessons from the general development finance experience in uh, bringing uh, the private sector in uh, through public private par partnerships in public in public uh, services like health education and other infrastructures uh, and and how wrong it has gone uh, in terms of both increasing indebtedness but also uh, failed results in terms of uh, public services delivery, quality public services, access, uh, increase in taxes uh, and fees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so I think there is a, a lot we can learn to demystify uh, this private sector role in climate uh, and, and, and green transition from the experience on, on development finance in the past uh, couple of decades. Uh, a few more concrete things. Uh, I think the there are two articles: the 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 micro microfinance, the green microfinance one, and uh, I can't find the other one uh, that focus on the definition of what is green. I think that is an, a, a a key element, uh, and I find uh, the 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 propo the propositive part on 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 that a little bit missing. Uh, we know there is a, a problem with uh, how taxonomy is defined, uh, how evaluations are being made, uh, who defines or not defines uh, what uh, green means, uh, the, 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 the blur uh, definition, uh, but also the, the lack of uh, accountability and transparency, uh, but uh, no proposals uh, in terms of should we have a I don't know global uh, institution defining what is green? Uh, should this be a, a discussion within the UNFCCC? Uh, should we have um, sorry a, a regulation that not only um, defines what green bonds so what <laughs> what means for a bond to be green? But also in terms of of, of public finance, uh, there was this uh, report that Reuters uh, uh, published uh, not long ago about how uh, World Bank uh, loans and, and 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 projects labeled as climate didn't have anything to do with climate. So uh, I, I don't know an agreed 
public uh, taxonomy uh, on, on green uh, maybe could be a way forward, but I don't know. I mean, I think there is a discussion there that is missing on how we solve this problem of the greenwashing uh, issue. Is it with uh, more regulation? Uh, is it uh, because uh, probably with uh, with the elimination of the financial markets, we won't solve the problem because we we, uh, we will even have the the World Bank doing their own thing. Um, and and sort of linked to that, I I, I like the uh, the article on on the Escazú agreement and uh, and the municipal uh, bond because it it raises a lot of the uh, specific problems. Uh, that that we find when we enter into uh, into this uh, green bonds business uh, for municipal, regional, uh, <coughs> uh, national uh, bond issuance, um, and the issue of uh, or the question uh, for me, uh, sorry for for the author and 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 for the rest of the group, again li linking on on what is the way forward would be. Um, is an agreement like Escazú that is basically a voluntary agreement. So investors decide whether to engage or or, or not. There is no way of um, enforcing it. Uh, the way forward, uh, or can we think of more binding approaches? Civil society has been putting on the table for quite a long time, more than a decade now, uh, proposals on binding responsible lending and borrowing principles. We even have a charter on responsible lending and borrowing principles at, uh, approved by the UN at UNCTAD, uh, not being implemented and, uh, and, and, and uh, disregarded by uh, everyone. Uh, but it's a, it's a point to start and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe something to think about. And also about the challenges uh, that the, the 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 new financial instruments uh, pose because not always one green bond uh, or one blue bond uh, equals one project. In many occasions, there are issuance that are green bonds, and then the government, the promise that the government or the institution makes is that they will do uh, a list of investments, and it's not just one project that you can. Uh, attached to a part the, the participation of one specific community uh, or uh, yeah or or one 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 specific process um two two more things one is uh, the the link between the micro and the macro uh, i have to say that i when when i when i uh, uh, read the the uh, microfinance green microfinancing uh, article it's very it's quite far away from what i work but i always think about what is the link between this and and what i do and working on on more general debt issues uh, uh, from a feminist perspective we found that uh, in in many countries uh, for instance in argentina or in bolivia something that was happening is that when the government is over indebted and uh, they start uh, applying uh, austerity measures and cutting on public services, that uh, makes families go more into personal uh, and, and, and micro uh, debts to be able to uh, <coughs> access uh, certain basic services, not only housing, which is most, mo the most obvious one, but also education or even uh, health. Uh, and how this public debt is uh, linked uh, to this, to the, to the, uh, so, the, so how public debt and austerity are creating a market for microfinancing by cutting on public services. I don't know if you follow that. And, and from a feminist perspective, that is very strong because uh, it's normally women that are um, targeted uh for this uh, microfinancing and i was wondering if something similar could be thought in 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 the issue of uh, of of green microfinancing and thinking about how for instance uh, when the like macro uh, green bonds uh, target uh, macro investments uh, and macro projects uh, that do not uh, deliver on results for communities Communities have to invent uh, um, entrepreneurship 
projects uh, to be able to have access, for instance, to cheap renewable er uh, energies. And here is where uh, the microfinance might come in, but it's by the, ma the macro uh, failing uh, covering those needs. And uh, one last comment is on, on the issue of, uh, of, of loss and damage. Uh, I think uh, the, the and, and I'm linking with the, with the beginning of my uh, intervention, how uh, with loss and damage is where the issue of uh, common but the, uh, differentiated responsibilities is more uh, burning uh, and how the debt instruments are uh, less uh, appropriate uh, for 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 this. Sorry, but I I went too long, but uh, I'll, I'll leave it there. No, thanks, thanks a lot, Yolanda, and 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 sorry, that I was just you know thinking about the the continuation. I I think that you you kind of really uh, gave us such a such a valuable and thorough and attentive reading of of all the blog posts and connecting the dots, like despite a very heavy and uh, and uh, and. A busy agenda that you that you have, and, and I'm I'm sure that individual authors will love to to get back to you and, uh, and 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 have this conversation. And I think that if today can be also a moment for for proposing this possibility of more partnership between academia and, and non academic institutions and really working together, I think that that would be a massive uh, success of this uh, of this first attempt of establishing a, a a network that really wants to go beyond uh, beyond today and hopefully will uh, will just. Uh, get bigger and bigger with more articles, more papers, reacting to what you were raising, what uh, Carolina was raising and, and other thoughts that I'm sure that people that people have. Uh, in the interest of time, I will uh, go to André. And then after uh, André's uh, intervention, we will open the floor uh, in, uh, to anyone who wants to raise uh, questions or who wants to, to make some, some comments. And then we will try to have a, a sort of wrap up final final moment with uh, with the authors that have been uh, that have been speaking. But as I said, it's just uh, the first moment of a series of conversation that we hope to have. Uh, Andre, thanks uh, also to you for for being here. Really looking forward to to yeah. hear your, your intervention. Well, yeah, no, great. Um, I echo what the previous respondents say about you know really enjoying all the papers. I thought they were excellent. Um, and this is clearly a massive subject, and we've already you know, opened up the debate a lot. And I know the time is, you know, escaping us. So I'm going to try and keep it quite short so we can give some discussion. And I just, uh, a lot of the points I was going to make <clears throat> have already been made before. So I was thinking, coming at it from a slightly different perspective, um, my background, um, as I've worked a lot with uh, coastal communities in Africa, um, probably about 15 years on kind of localized projects. And what we found about 2014, things changed in the conservation world quite profoundly. You know, the type of presentations that coastal communities were getting around blue growth and the blue economy, they, they became more and more dominated by financial people. Um, and the conservation NGOs who dominate this, particularly from the US and, and Europe, you know, the people who they're employing, it changed. There were people who you were saying, well, you know, who is this person coming up in a suit and these beautiful PDF presentations? Um, and you look up their kind of backgrounds and you find that they've been working at Goldman Sachs or McKinsey Company Consulting. Um, you know, they're bankers. And that was something I think a lot of people felt was quite peculiar, you know. And actually, in my research, I think in some of these big US NGOs, that started to change after 2008. It was a strategy the big conservation organizations, they headhunted people from the big investment banks because of several reasons. One of them was that they felt the pinch after the financial crisis. They were worried about their money. You know, it's a period of austerity. So they wanted to generate new funds. So particularly one of them was called uh, what is called the Nature Conservancy. And they headhunted quite a, quite a senior guy from Goldman Sachs. And so those people came into those organizations and financialize them. They, they changed the culture, their strategies, and they started to, you know, form greater partnerships with um, financial institutions. Whereas I think in the previous decade or two decades, those conservation organizations were having partnerships with multinational companies involved in production of goods and, goods and services, such as, you know, Coca-Cola or some of the big industrial agricultural um, companies. But after 2008, those partnerships changed to financial institutes. And I think that change 
has really shifted the conservation world. So that's one of the entry points for me. You know, who are these people? What is this new culture, this new kind of US conservation model? And then I was doing some work in Seychelles. And this, I think, is a really interesting case study for this, the way debt is conceptualized in conservation. Um, and our, our next paper is very good on this, um, although I'm going to challenge him on something. You know, Seychelles was one of the first countries to do one of these debt swaps. And I think that's sort of missing from your analysis a bit because we're treating debt as just, you know, through these bonds that developing countries are, asked, are borrowing more money and then adding to their debt. Of course, with debt swaps, the, you know, the conservation organizations or international development are coming up with a very different argument, a different logic. They're saying one of the problems in conservation is caused by indebtedness. Therefore, to solve the conservation problem, you need to reduce debt. And that argument goes back to the 1980s when debt swaps first came about. That was introduced by WWF. And they were saying there's a terrible problem with debt in Latin America, and it stops countries being able to afford to save their forests. We need to tackle debt in order to help conservation. Of course, I mean, there's a problem in that logic as well. But if you fast forward to Seychelles, what happened? They did a debt swap. Two years later, they did a blue bond. So that on the one hand, the same organization is, is justifying reducing debt to create savings to save the oceans. As soon as they've done that, they tell the country, right, you need to go and borrow more money off the capital markets to continue to save the oceans. So debt, leveraging debt from two different perspectives. The common theme in both is that the conservation organization was opportunistic and made a lot of money out of both instruments. And I think that that is something that we should call them out on. Um, so I think what we should be aware of, and I'm also aware of the time, is that there are a suite of these instruments that leverage debt in different ways. And um, we should see that as dynamic. And one of the areas which I think is quite interesting, um, and I've been working on this with Yoanda for, for a report on Eurodad, is a new form of bond called a sustainability linked bond whoever knows, you know, it's such a strange ter term, but basically it is a bond that exists between a green bond and a debt swap. It's a bond that is based on countries borrowing money and they pay back, what they pay back to investors is determined by a performance indicator, right? So if they save some of their forests, they don't pay back so much money. If they fail to save some of their forests, they have to pay back a bit more money. Now, one of the weird things about these bonds is they don't come with any promises to use the money for any specific end. So they've been marketed to countries who their credit rating scores are not particularly good. So they're not good enough to get a green bond. Um, they're too risky. They're not quite as bad as some countries in needing a debt swap, but they can raise this money with some performance indicators, and then they can use a bit of that money to refinance bad debt. So you know, I think what's interesting is just look at these range of new financial instruments. Most of them, most of us can't understand. And I think that is really important to remember, you know, when you're talking uh, or doing publications, which you hope to influence um, a wide range of civil society organizations, coastal communities, forest groups, people are completely confused by these things. So they're bamboozled by the jargon. And there's a real responsibility for people who are researching this to be able to explain it in plain English. Um, so we can get through all this financial jargon. Um, yeah, they were just observations. I could say a lot more about all these things, including cap bonds is another area I think is really important to look at, the way that countries are being encouraged to take out insurance for the climate change. Um, I think there's an area of another opportunities for a lot of profit making um, by lots of organizations. I want to also end with coming back to this funding gap issue. And I think it's a burning issue that um, all the, the, the previous two respondents raised. Um, it's not that it's more important than the other issues, but I think there's something quite unresolved about that. And I would look at it in, in, in a several different ways. I think one of the key criticisms we already heard is this idea that there isn't enough money to save the planet um, coming from public resources. So, we, by logic, we have to turn to private capital markets to bridge this gap. Um, and a lot of people are saying, well, no, that's not true. We don't have to turn to private financial markets as we can generate this money through other means. 
uh, all sorts of uh, ways of rede redirecting resources, taxing uh, higher what you know on wealth, um, carbon tax, for instance. So there's that argument saying, well, you don't have to have private finance; you can do it through public finance. But I think there's a third criticism of the funding gap, um, and it's really it becomes obvious when you come at this from a conservation perspective, particularly in the oceans or forestry. And that's when you look at and you read these gap talk reports, which there are so many, clearly their estimates of what the gap is are bonkers. They're just made up. Um, you know, they say, ah, oh, you need um, $800 billion in order to save nature being spent every year. And you think, oh, that's a lot of money. And you think, well, where did you get that figure from? And you look at the reports underlining them and they're just made up. And they're made up by organizations that are in the business of raising funds and spending funds. And I think we have to be a bit cynical about this. Um, no one is really scrutinizing them. In the oceans, I think the annual funding gap has been something like 500 million or something. I can't remember. But it's nonsense. It's just it's based on the value of carbon trading markets, how much it costs to um, reduce subsidies in fisheries, just random figures that someone puts together. And what I want to make the point of is if you, you know, from a perspective of what works in terms of creating sustainable communities around fisheries and forestry, you know, kind of restoring the commons, if you like, that literature very rarely comes to the conclusion that it's about money. You know, obviously, it's a range of issues around politics, the way people interact with resources, um, you know, addressing corruption, um, the abuse of uh, industrial companies and extractive industries and the very idea that this is solved by money is of course you know is very peculiar and it's not how most academic literature would approach this but yet when we come to these big meetings so many people just nod their head when there's a funding gap or they say no it should come from public sources I think we should be doing more to, to kind of challenge that narrative and say it's not a funding gap it's a political gap yeah you know there's other problems here um so I think that's you did raise that. I just encourage us all to kind of maybe interrogate the financing gap, because clearly there are things that need more money. I don't want to simplify it and say it's not about money. I just think we should be, you know, interrogate it a lot more closely, uh, unpack it. I think that's my final comment. But again, thanks to everyone for amazing papers and a really interesting discussion. And I echo the point that it's would really welcome this to be a beginning of a conversation and collaboration. Cheers. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Andrea, also for, for pushing us to, to, to go beyond and uh, and for proposing a, a different reading or alternative reading to, to one of the main points that uh, definitely has been characterizing a lot of the of the blog post. And uh, and personally, I've been learning a lot from all the presentations and, and even more, I would say, from the from the reactions that uh, Carolina, Yolanda and, and, and Andrea have been have been sharing with us. And, and I really look forward to, to continuing the conversation. I propose that we maybe go 10 minutes extra time, but not more than that, because I think that commitment is a commitment, even if we started a bit later. So I would open up the floor to anyone who has a question. I think that you can raise your, your hands. And uh, in the meanwhile, I would say the questions can also come from the, the authors themselves and could be questions uh, maybe to our uh, interlocutors and, and, and to the, the, our, our experts, let's say, that, uh, that intervene uh, and can be a reaction to what they, they said, or it can be a, a sort of direct uh, uh, point that uh, was raised uh, to you and that you would like to, to uh, put on the table uh, at this moment. And I'm saying that because I'm not seeing particularly any hands coming from the, from the audience. So I would, uh, I would invite uh, anyone who has already, has already spoken to, to be bold and, and brave. Um, Hector, thanks for, for breaking the ice. Uh, uh, Yolanda, uh, just uh, to respond, uh, Yolanda, thank you for, for, for your comment, uh, particularly about my blog, and also to respond to, uh, to your comment about it, uh, about the possibilities of the application of the Escazú Agreement to the green bonds ex expansion in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I had like I had two two brief comments because there is not much time. One is like a is the case by case possibility, and there is there is the possibility this this uh, uh, green bonds uh, uh, going into court so and, and and until the legal analysis. 
And I, I, I think of the experience of the rich experience with municipal bonds in the United States. There is a huge case law in the U United States where they analyze the liabilities, for example, with green, green, greenwashing, uh, mis, misinforming uh, investors, for example. Um, how the case law may ar arise in, in Latin America, that's a question. And the second is about like uh, the implementing uh, policies uh, and that would be, for example, uh, com uh, coming from the experience of development finance already in place with projects uh, and uh, uh, that already had like a development finance funding, like uh, from development banks, and how that experience, like uh, we had lessons learned from that, that experience, and how that may apply to the, these new climate finance instruments. But this is huge. <laughs> this is huge. But that's are like uh, just uh, starting like uh, comments. Thank you. Thanks, thanks a lot, Hector. I think that there is a, a common element here of what do we learn from other sector and what do we learn from the past that has also been raised by by Yolanda and by and by others. And I think that these are definitely conversations that uh, that must happen to make sure that it's not just because there is green or sustainability or any fancy name before or after the notion of debt or debt uh, instrument. We don't interact with uh, what has been done uh, already by by several organizations or by several academics and is done on a on a daily basis. So fragmentation has been raised as one of the problems and one of the issues of keeping all the, the conversation to, into silos and not really bridging bridging these this spaces. And, and, and definitely, uh, I really appreciate that we've been reminded even once more that these are the kind of conversations that should be happening. And this is how we should uh, be building a network that is, uh, that is aware uh, of you know, what has been done so far and what is going on on a daily basis, including with the work that organizations like Eurodot and others are, are doing. Uh, David, I see your, your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to share a quick uh, transversal uh, answer to the transversal great comments from the from the commentators and you know pick up a couple of elements. And one that really uh, got my attention was uh, I mean the, the common thread, right? That uh, Carolina, you were rising about uh, the no alternative uh, problem, right? The fact that uh, in these different fields, there it looks like uh, it is difficult to uh, to propose uh, alternative views or uh, or to come with proposals, right? Yolanda, Yolanda was a bit your also your comment on some of the of the interventions, and and what what got me thinking is uh, uh, well, th there are different ways for leading to the alternatives, and some words that was were coming up was resistance. And you know there are all several techniques of resistance that we all know in development in law, um, uh, but it, more and more also when I'm studying this uh, loss uh, loss and damage problem, what I'm all, uh, thinking about uh, is actually also the possibility for alternatives, right? So. Um, uh, the general way in which I'm thinking is, okay, so uh, the, the law, or in my case, uh, the, uh, what I'm studying, the governance of the scheme does not allow for uh, for meaningful form, forms of resistance, uh, but is there a, an alternative that can be created? Um, so it got, one thing that I was thinking, and, and, and then I'll, I'll stop there on this point, is, for instance, on the question of defining green in green bonds, uh, I am not seeing around, but by uh, this, this might be limited to my understanding, an alternative green bond standard developed out there that could be promoted, uh, that, that would be a way more rigorous than the, the current standards and, and taxonomies uh, out there. But I might be wrong here, so I'm really curious to hear maybe if it's alternative, alternatives are being, are being created. And then uh, to give a very quick uh, flash uh, uh, reaction to the to Yolanda stake on loss and damage CBDR and the burning question as uh, as if the, the to the question of there can be um, uh, legal actions yeah taken with regards to loss and damage uh, the answer is uh, generally uh, yes it is actually uh, happening in an indirect way in international law uh, where. Uh, as some of you might know, uh, small island developing states have been pushing at the UN General Assembly for an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice on several points, including the consequences, the responsibilities of, of states on climate change. And it looks like there the International Court of Justice might have a say actually on the responsibilities of developed countries with regards to 
uh, loss and damage. So is that going to be a silver bullet or uh, is going to solve the, the VAX legal question? I, I don't, don't know. Uh, but certainly uh, that's an example of a pathway because yeah, law can work right for, through different means of different scales. Thanks, thanks a lot, David. And, uh, and definitely let's see what the International Court of Justice is, uh, is going to be saying. So I see three hands, so I will definitely get there. But there are also two questions that I'm going to put uh, on the table for, for anyone to, to react. Uh, and then I think the two, two questions, the three hands, and then a reaction, and then uh, maybe we, we can close, because otherwise we can definitely continue uh, for, for way longer. So there is a question by Hari Prasad, who is uh, directed to, to Andre, but I think that uh, it may also apply to, to Orange, because I know that uh, the line of investigation is very similar. Um, is that uh, the question goes uh, saying that um, uh, Andre mentioned the necessity of interrogating the funding gap in conservation. Uh, and wonder is if there are other aspects of debt for nature swaps that have not been researched enough. So what are the critical takes on debt for nature swaps should be at the center of, uh, of investigation and academic research, but also I would say of uh, this interaction with uh, non-academic actors. And then we have Bram, who's raising a, a, a very important question, also the other one and all the other questions are important, um, on the more public side of the story. So when we think about that that is contracted not uh, by private actors but that that is contracted by public actors um and so the question goes uh does what we've been discussing what you've been discussing also reflects with the ongoing conversations on uh, on sovereign debt and the broader uh, notion or the broader the link with the broader notion of colonial ecological and, and climate debt and to what extent are we also talking and discussing debt cancellation and is debt cancellation coming to the to the floor when uh, when you engage with your um, reflections and then I, we go to Farwa who hasn't uh, intervened yet from Eurodad thanks a lot Farwa for, for joining us and then uh, Carolina and then Gidre and then I will just give a possibility to anyone to to intervene up to a certain moment so Farwa if you want to go first yeah, sorry, just wondering if, if you want to answer the two questions first, or should I just go now? I think I'll collect all the questions and, and then I'll, I'll open up to, to, to answers to anyone who wants to answer, because otherwise it's going to definitely go way longer than, uh, than expected. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks a lot for this. This is very interesting. And um, actually, it, it also brushes upon a lot of things that we're doing at Eurodat or with Yolanda, but also with Andre. One question or reflection that I had was on the role of developing countries and um, so-called emerging markets, uh, BRICS themselves and their participation in the whole greening of instruments. So uh, on the one hand, you see that there is a strong demand for reparations. There is a very interesting role of credit rating agencies in this, but at the same time, these are countries who are also issuing bonds. So this contradiction is quite interesting if we consider that there is elements of uh, multipolarity, um, no matter how you define it, and an increasing role for developing countries and having a say on the role of private finance. So we see that with the Bridgetown, but also with this demand for a green bank um, by Kenya's uh, prime minister uh, at the Macron summit. And I think this has to be um, reflected upon more closely because uh, whilst these countries are the recipients of the, the, the worst impacts of climate change, and there is this element of choicelessness within the global financial architecture, but at the same time, they are also issuing these debts. So how do you A, rationalize it? And then how do you, we, we just talked about the idea of resistance. How do you see resistance coming from that? And I think it's not a it's not an easy uh, approach, but I think this has to be integrated somehow in a lot of um, upcoming research. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that. Thanks. Thanks, thanks a lot, Howard. Definitely much appreciated and, and, and pushing forward uh, even more our, our argument and definitely more and more reasons to also reflect what has been happening in Paris uh, a couple of weeks ago and, and how all of that uh, kind of connect and, and, and poses new questions and new challenges also to the underlying reflection. Um, Carolina? Thank you very much. Well, I just wanted to reply uh, to some of the, the comments that have been made before. I'm going to, to connect them. The first one is, I don't know, maybe I was not clear enough in my English. When, when I was echoing the idea of China, of China, you know, that, that there is no alternative uh, in the way it was used in the 80s. 
<clears throat> is not to affirm that there is such that we are in such a position. It's about how do we research, uh, how we come in the first place to believe that there is no alternative. So I'm here closest to, closer to, to Andre in terms of, let's look at how these bongos or made up way of looking at uh, um, the needed times of finance to overcome um, climate borders uh, was made up in the first place. So in this sense, I connect to Yolanda's um, intervention in terms of proposal and echoing also, I don't know who was talking about this, but this idea that I, is, for me, it's not about proposals, thinking about the, the social movements I work with, but about ways of resistance, and in many cases, ways of surviving. So in that sense, when I was reading your papers, what I want to look at is not a proposal to replace what is in place in terms of microfinance, green bonds, blue bonds, carbon offsets, offsets but actually how to resist them in terms of the people that have been uh, trapped into debt. So in that sense is that I, <clears throat> I was thinking how important it is for this group and other people to carry on and research um, for instance, the matrix of profit, like how we can show the extreme profiting uh, coming from this, how we can geo-reference uh, the convergence between profit, green bonds, debt, and social ecological conflicts. Uh, we could just do, do this, this convergence that is very evident, at least in, in Colombia. Uh, <clears throat> And this takes me to the idea of framing and what Andre was saying also. Is how do we frame the way in which we approach these issues? Uh, how we politically uh, frame them? Uh, and uh, this would take us in different ways, uh, whether to improve what it is in place or going to uh, another ways of either resistance or options. For instance, the obvious that. Um, question that was suggested by Tommaso Angedre in the introduction to the papers, but it's, it's still in the air, the idea of the obvious debts, that tracing extreme profiting, tracing the debt, the debt trap, tracing uh, the way in which future options for social movements and the people suffering the most, uh, and how they are trapping a future debt, it might be a way to creating um, um, the arguments we're speaking about all these depths and all these depths in, in climate. Uh, so I think, uh, it, and there is another two things that I think fantastic with David is like the idea of climate bureaucrats, how tracing in this way of doing this tracing for all these depths or other options, how petite law um, benchmarks and these climate bureaucrats ways of working in this managerialism uh, show us the spaces for another way of doing litigation for me and doing litigation against these uh, small places of producing uh, a legal matrix that is not properly legal. And also for Hector, I think this is fantastic, like uh, how I'm, I'm, I'm not very, I don't throw that much into Escazú. I think it promises more than it gives, but but uh, having said that, uh, precisely with, with, with this, what I'm thinking is not how to incorporate Escazú agreement into the investment architecture, but actually how to use this Escazú agreement nationally and in other uh, regional courts or spaces for liti uh, strategic litigation against uh, the finance structure, precisely against in order to get a disclosure of information. Because otherwise, and this is a question for you, Hector, otherwise for me, it's risky. If we incorporate it, if, if the framing is incorporating Escazú agreement into the um, green finance architecture, we might risk ending up financializing Escazú. And that would be like uh, going, going in the other way. So that's what I want to say. Just trying to collect and to, to talk about more about ways of resistance rather than proposal for improving. Thank you. Your papers were fantastic. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Carolina. And definitely that of the, the way forward is uh, is something that sometimes academics forget. And, and it's good that we are reminded of that. And, uh, and definitely 
sets the basis for for further conversation about where do we go from here and what do we what do we learn and and how we can avoid avoid financialization of discourse financialization of uh, academia itself and and financialization of any form of resistance or, or reaction and not accepting just to 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 tweak the the, the margins and and to adjust a little bit a, a structure that uh, as we mentioned in the introduction as you as you uh, reminded, uh, like, is based on, on structural injustices and as at the center of the construction of racial capitalism and uh, and, and and the problems that we are that we are discussing. Um, Andre, I see your your hand, so I give you the floor, and then I think yeah. I'll just wrap up. Yeah, I know. I had a, well, I had a couple of questions um, before I do. I think one area that's interesting to look at um, is the legal clauses that are in these contracts for the bond um, prospectus, not the the bond contracts with investors increasingly these come with a provision that um, the money might not be used for green things and you can't sue us <laughs> so um, there's quite a, that's kind of normal now and uh, I had to look at some of those sovereign contracts and they mostly always contain that so that's something to think about um, I also think that there are lots of human rights laws um, and Iskasu and Aarhus convention that would be very useful for advocates advocacy around the abuse of uh, transparency and public participation on green bonds and debt swaps. I think that's not something that should be dismissed. You know, a lot of these instruments are being finalized without uh, public consultation. Um, and that's a fairly low hanging fruit, I think, for advocacy to, to nail them. Then the question of is there any research on, on these debt swaps um, that hasn't been done. And that's a very, you know, specific technical issue. And I think there are lots and what it comes down to, I think, a lot of the time is the painstaking research to follow the money and the people involved. Um, and there has been some really interesting research, and I've contributed to some of it, where you start realizing how much profit intermediaries are making in these deals. Um, and just putting it down on paper, it kind of shames them. And it does cast these financial instruments in a different light. Um, and in Ecuador, I'll end with this one, that, um, you know, they just had this enormous debt swap with over a billion dollars of money that Pew Charitable Trust, this ocean conservation group in America, has concluded with another organization called the Ocean Finance Company. And they're on all of these press release. The Ocean Finance Company has, you know, refinanced debt of Ecuador and is now in control of a new multi-stakeholder fund in Ecuador. I said, who, who is Ocean Finance Company? And it's basically a new startup set up by a South, Af uh, South African whose history is in the mining industry. And if you look at where he's come from and what he's doing, how much money they're making out of this deal, and the fact that this organization is now sitting in Ecuador for the next 20 years, determining how millions of dollars are going to be spent to supposedly help coastal fishing communities, they have zero history of anything to do with marine. Um, and I think, you know, we as much as it does, it's very important to conceptualize these things at a, a theoretical level, at a macro level. I think researchers, we should be following the money, you know, really investigating some of these deals. My very last point, I think we should compare these debt swaps with what's happened with in Cap, Cap Verde with Portugal, um, which is like a kind of conditional debt forgiveness. I see problems in that as well, but it's quite a lot more appealing than what's happening um, in other countries. And I think that, well, I'm actually writing a little blog post on that now and I'll share it with you. Sorry, I have to take too long. Fantastic. No, that, that's, that's great. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Andre, both for the indication that there is more thoughts coming forward uh, uh, in, in the future, uh, but also for this idea of looking concretely at cases. And I think that that's also something that academics can do in order to actively be engaged and supportive of uh, what movements and organizations are, are doing, which is less at the at the macro, like sort of metaphysical level, but much more concrete in the in the real life and the, the way in which these financial instruments and financial dynamics create indebtedness on one hand, but they create profit and, and accumulation of, uh, of value on the on the other hand. I see Yolanda hand. And with Yolanda, I think that uh, we then close, uh, and then I'll, I'll try to wrap up. Thanks, thanks a lot, Yolanda, again for. Thank you. It's it's just a very quick reaction with, uh, to what Andrew was just saying because I I really agree with what he was saying. There need there's need to follow the money and and do more research on what is really going on in this. But uh, linking with with my question on 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 proposals beyond resisting is. The, the idea of having a, a statutory approach to all 
uh, those financial instruments because the problem is that at the moment they are regulated by these contracts and these clauses and they can do whatever if they put it in the clause and that's how the uh, innovations advance and for organizations like mine that do uh, advocacy it would be very useful to have uh, inputs on on how to make proposals for international institutions like the UN and, and, and others to say okay how how would a regulation of these instruments would look like uh, in terms of constraining uh, the, the, the different problems and the different risks that we're seeing. Not that regulation will change it all, for sure. It's capitalism and, and you cannot regulate uh, the, the whole of it. But at, at least reflecting on how we can advance in, in, in making it more difficult for them doing whatever they want and making money uh, and, 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 and taking uh, sovereignty of, of countries like the case of, of Ecuador. Um, and one of the, of the issues that uh, I was in a, in a meeting the other day, and they were discussing debt transparency, which is a stupid uh, discussion because it's like, yeah, public debt uh, contracts should be open, should, should be public. And 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 one of the uh, of the speakers, an academic in the in the panel, said, "Just let's make any uh, debt uh, instrument, any debt contract that is not transparent illegal. It's as simple as that. You you cannot uh, reclaim the money back if if you're not uh, being uh, compliant with transparency laws." And, and and sometimes when I, when I mean statutory, I mean th this kind of radical changes in terms of how we regulate and how we approach these issues. Because we can, I mean, there is an extent to which we can follow the money up because it's so opaque and so untransparent. So we need, also need to do this kind of. I, I see these proposals as as resisting as as well. Uh, and and yeah, I don't know. Just wanted to share that. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Yolanda. And uh, and thanks uh, to everyone who, who wrote the blog post, to everyone who read them, and in particular to the, the three commentators who gave us a, a lot of food for thoughts and uh, and very valuable reflection on, on the project it, uh, itself. Also, thanks to those who, who, who joined and, and contributed to the, to the conversation with the question in the chat and uh, uh, with their intervention. Um, I'm, I'm a co-organizer of this event, so I, I'm definitely biased, but I, I think that it was a great success because I think what we wanted was to have more questions, to, to be uh, pushed into new ways of thinking and to be pushed into what can academia do and what can interactions do uh, when we think about something as fundamental as, as the way in which specific financial instruments have been shaping the economy and now are shaping not only the economy, but also ecological dynamics. We, we got a lot of questions. We got a lot of, a, a lot of uh, uh, very valuable interventions um, that span from the very macro narratives, legitimacy and questions about, about the gap to the very uh, concrete of uh, increasing or making mandatory the, the transparency whenever uh, public administration and public actors are uh, contracting uh, debt or, or subscribing uh, debt, debt instruments. I think is a is a wide space of uh, of reflection. Is a wide space of, of opportunities for for engagement and uh, and interconnections. And I and I really hope that the blog series will not stop. It's my my hope that uh, it will become an opportunity for everyone uh, working on at this intersection between uh, between climate discourse and and debt discourse to find a space uh, to to learn, but also a space to continue contributing with new knowledge. So I. I kind of hope that Adi will be will be happy to host the the series for a little bit longer, and then more people will feel like uh, contributing. And I and I'm sure that a lot of people who are uh, attending today have a lot to say that could be translated into into a blog post. I also hope that uh, we don't finish with the blog post and the, and this meeting today. That there will be other opportunities to meet in person, in person or even uh, digitally, but really to move forward and to move forward, identifying some of the priorities among all the, the, the various interventions that have, been, that have been raised today. So my commitment, and I, and I speak for myself, but I hope that it's uh, shared by everyone who's been participating to the, to the blog series, is to really to take today as a, as a starting point for a, for, a, for a longer collaboration that can go in all directions, but at least that we can know that uh, we are uh, interested in, and, and, and our brains and, and, and maybe also our hearts are very close to the same, to the same topic. So I, I really hope that everyone will stay in touch. Um, our 
uh, information uh, is available somewhere, but if you cannot find the, the information and you want to get in touch, please reach out to me or reach out to Christiane Liadi, uh, and I'm sure that uh, we can create the connections and the bridges that are needed in order to, to take this conversation further. So thanks again to, to, to Christiane for hosting this, for, for organizing it, and, and thanks to, to all of you who spoke and participated. And I really hope that the, the recording can, can keep circulating and that this becomes like uh, that day in, in 2023 when we had this that meeting that then becomes something way bigger and that uh, really reinforces the amazing work that all of you um, are doing. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the, the rest of the day. And uh, it's been a pleasure. I learned a lot and I'm sure that I will continue learning a lot. Thanks to, to all of you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks also yeah. from my side. Just to make it very short, of course, we can support uh, everything that this group will be doing. Uh, feel free to submit blog posts in that series. And there's also the opportunity to establish an ARD working group, for example, uh, on debt and the green tr transition or on debt based instruments and critical, critical views on them. And there might also be always a little funding opportunity for, I don't know, a special publication or a workshop or whatever. So if you're interested, just reach out to me. And yeah, hoping to see you all again. Fantastic. Have a nice evening. Thanks a lot, Christiane. Thanks a lot, Yadin. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Take care. Thank Thank you. You.